Welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Kenneth Weinstein, the Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow at Hudson, and I'm honored to welcome Professor Yasuhiro Matsuda of Tokyo University to Hudson for a conversation on the implications of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine for the Indo-Pacific. As the free world and the West grapple with Russia's war on Ukraine, there's growing concern in Asia about the broader implications for the security of the Indo-Pacific. And I, I really cannot imagine anyone better to analyze these implications than uh, Professor Yasuhiro Matsuda of the University of Tokyo. He is quite simply one of Japan's leading foreign and security policy experts and a specialist on China, Taiwan, and cross-strait relations. Uh, delighted to welcome you here. Professor Matsuda began his career at the National Institute for Defense Studies before moving to what is now the Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia at the University of Tokyo, where he serves as professor. His policy advice is widely sought in his native Japan and elsewhere, and he has won academic fellowships at top universities and think tanks in his native Japan, but also in the US, Taiwan, and China. And he has won numerous academic prizes for his publications, which have appeared in English, Chinese and Japanese, among other languages, and the, including the Yasuhiro Nakasone Award of Excellence. So delighted to welcome you here. I'd love to get your uh, opening assessment of uh, the implications of uh, Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine, and then we'll dig into it deeper in conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, let me uh, just uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know, today's topic. Uh, Putin's war uh, against Ukraine's impact on the in the Pacific. Uh, let me uh, break down into three different parts. The first one is uh, Europe or in the Pacific. The second one is uh, about China, its impact about China. The third one is uh, what is the difference and similarities and difference between Ukraine and a Taiwanese a tai a Taiwan contingency. Firstly, um, I think that uh, uh, current administration, uh, following Trump administration, is focusing uh, pretty much on Indo-Pacific, and uh, it is also aiming at uh, China. How to ch uh, dealing? How to deal with uh, the China Chinese challenge? Um, and this move uh, also, to some extent, uh, triggered that uh, Russia uh, can. Uh, uh, find a kind of window of opportunities to, to change the status quo uh, by use of force in Ukraine. So um, there is a kind, this kind of you know, cause and effect relationship, not 100%, uh, but there is uh, that kind of situation. Uh, uh, President Biden also um, met him earlier than uh, having a summit, uh, you know, video summit meeting with uh, Xi Jinping. So it means that the uh, focus is China, uh, not Russia. So um, uh, there is a kind of a, 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 a comparison between Europe and uh, you know, uh, Indo-Pacific. And now uh, this war has a, a, is a, has a giving a very big impact. Um, you know, Putin's war on uh, Ukraine is like um, uh, 9 11 uh, terrorist attack. It will change the world. And, uh, uh, you know, US uh, has to uh, uh, refocus uh, Europe. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, uh, we, ha we, are, we are now uh, witnessing. But is, is that a long term change or is that a fundamental change? I doubt. Because uh, Europe is a continental uh, theater. Uh, Indo-Pacific is a, a maritime theater. So U.S. can still uh, deal with two different theaters. One is, uh, you know, Europe, and the other is, uh, uh, you know, Indo-Pacific. So uh, we have already witnessed that uh, U.S. has sent many fleets to Western Pacific in order to deter China and uh, 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 North Koreans. Uh, potential uh, move. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, it's not a fundamental change, but at least in the uh, short term, uh, U.S. has to, uh, you know, put more importance on uh, Europe. Uh, that, that's my first observation. 
And the second one is that uh, China's involvement on this uh, issue. You know, uh, without China's support, such as purchasing uh, uh, natural gas by ruble, uh, that's without that kind of support, uh, Putin was not confident to to change the status quo in Ukraine, uh, invade into Ukraine. So uh, China's uh, role is very important for Russia. And as for China, China has been suffering uh, a kind of encirclement uh, efforts by the United States, uh, strengthening the uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, uh, alliance and also setting up the uh, AUKUS and uh, that kind of thing. You know, uh, China was suffering those pressures. So in order to resist the U.S. pressure, China needs Russia. So the uh, uh, Sino-Russian uh, summit meeting at the, the opening ceremony of uh, the Beijing Winter Olympic Games is a kind of symbol of a kind of, you know, uh, the uh, necessity and the inevitability of uh, the cooperation of the two nations. And uh, what actually, uh, you know, uh, Putin told to Xi Jinping is still a mystery. You know, there are some, you know, uh, uh, reports, but there are, I, I think that there are three different scenarios. The first one is Putin didn't tell anything, and uh, China was just uh, guessing what would happen. So it's like uh, Putin was, Putin was uh, deceiving China. I don't think so. This is a very naive scenario. The second one is Putin said something about use of force, uh, but did not tell China it's a full invasion. Uh, so um, China was half half deceived <laughs> by Putin. You know, th this is the second scenario. And the third uh, hypothesis is that Putin told everything. I'm I'm going to uh, take over the whole Ukraine uh, because. Uh, U.S. and Europe is divided. Uh, inside of U uh, United States is also divided. Ukraine is also divided. Uh, if we push a little bit, they will collapse. So now the, the Western world, the U.S. is declining. Western world is declining. Uh, it's a, an opportunity for us, both of us, to change the status quo. I tend not to uh, take this scenario mm -hmm. as well. It's a, a little bit too, uh, you know, extreme. But still, you know, I think that truth should ex exist between the second and the third uh, scenario. Uh, Putin told something uh, related to the use of force in uh, China. You know, Xi Jinping answered that don't do that or uh, uh, don't do that during the Olympic Games or don't uh, never... Uh, do overdoing or something like that. Uh, but basically, uh, Xi Jinping uh, shared, to some extent, shared the same worldview that Western world is declining, U.S. is useless, and uh, it's our turn to uh, get the more eyes or something like that. I, I think that after the uh, COVID, COVID isolation, I think that uh, their worldview might become more and more extreme. So uh, China and Russia uh, are now binding together and resisting the Western world. I think that this is a kind of due course. Uh, this is the second part of my uh, uh, initial talk. And the third part is the difference between Ukraine contingency and Taiwan contingency. Um, there are some similarities. For example, uh, you know, very strong uh, nuclear uh, weapon state uh, tries to invade its neighbor, neighbor in Taiwan's case, uh, there is a big risk about this. And in Ukraine's case, it actually materialized. In Taiwan's case, it's still, still a risk. And in both nations, uh, in you know, Russia and China, uh, um, the personal dictatorship is uh, strengthened. So, for example, if Xi Jinping gets older and become much more uh, uh, 
uh, crazy about Taiwan and make a, make a very uh, serious you know, decision to seize Taiwan or something like that in the, in the future. It may occur. You know, the, the, the personal uh, uh, you know, dictatorship is very dangerous, right? But there are more uh, differences, such as uh, geography. You know, uh, Ukraine is a plain uh, land, plain country, uh, immediate neighbor of Russia. So it's uh, basically a land uh, uh, war, warfare. But um, in Taiwan's case, there is a you know, uh, Taiwan Strait, and which, uh, most of which uh, part are high seas. So it's an international water. And it is so difficult for Chinese PLA to send uh, huge troops uh, and doing a land operations and actually occupy the whole land. Uh, there, are, there are so many mountains over there. And uh, try to set up a new government and govern, uh, start the government uh, and resist it for, uh, and, and persist it for a long time. It's a very high bar, very, very difficult. And also, uh, Ukraine is not a part of U.S. Uh, sphere of influence, but Taiwan is. Taiwan is the you know, center of the U.S. sphere of influence. And, and uh, uh, U.S. has uh, Taiwan uh, Relations Act, which allows uh, U.S. to take appropriate action. As long as it's, as long as it's appropriate, uh, you know, U.S. can take uh, diplomatic efforts from diplomatic efforts to use of force, as long as it's... Uh, you know, uh, the appropriate. And uh, in Western Pacific, U.S. Uh, naval uh, uh, force is still very uh, superior to, to the Chinese. So uh, there are many, many uh, differences. So I think that uh, Taiwan contingency is not a today's issue or next week or next month issue. It's a much more mid to long term issue, five to 10 years when you know, China has its own you know, uh, time schedule. You know, this year, uh, China is going to have a 20th Party Congress. It's not just not the right timing. So after uh, Xi Jinping gains the longer term, then uh, build up its own uh, military capability, especially focusing on the nuclear arsenals. You know, China is deadly doing this. So, oh, and establish a very good uh, capability and uh, good enough to uh, deter U.S. intervention, then China can make a, a kind of what I named coercive peaceful unification. So deter, deterrence against the U.S. and uh, giving Taiwan uh, uh, time to uh, make a decision and ask them to uh, surrender. That kind of, you know, uh, coercive peaceful unification is the the cheapest way and uh, the best way for China uh, to achieve its you know, national unification goal. So although there are many, many differences, but as China becomes much, much more powerful, I think that uh, the situation uh, would become much more dangerous. So the rest of the world, especially United States, Japan, Taiwan, uh, will have to be prepared for even more uh, powerful China. Yeah, we have to do a lot of uh, jobs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was uh, an extraordinarily rich, characteristically extraordinarily rich uh, answer. A lot to analyze. Let, let me let me let's go. Let let's first look at the Russia China angle mm -hmm. first, because uh, in a sense that's the thing that I think we in Washington have the least uh, kind of uh, view into that. And you 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 I mean you know China well. And, you, and, and arguably, you know Russia well as well. What's your sense? I, I don't know much about Russia. <laughs> I don't speak You're Russian. <laughs> very, very, but we, but you, you, you have a sense of Russian geopolitics and the like. <laughs> your sense of how the Chinese view uh, Vladimir Putin and how Xi Jinping vla views Vladimir Putin, how, how, you know, how close is uh, their bond? Uh, is this a relationship of respect? Is it a relationship of utility? You know, it's a very uh, uh, interesting topic uh, of, you know, uh, Sino-Russian mutual, uh, you know, image or perception. Now, ordinary people and even experts, uh, for example, uh, uh, Chinese uh, Russian, Russian experts, uh, do not really like Russia. 
uh, and, and the Russian and China experts do not actually like uh, you know, uh, uh, China, and they don't trust each other. But we uh, should not highlight this situation too much because strategic importance of uh, China and strategic importance of Russia for each other are too really uh, important. So I think that uh, strategic importance in order to resist uh, the United States uh, overwhelmed everything. So they, they are bind, binded together. You know, this is the first thing. And uh, as for China, uh, Russia is a very uh, good counterpart to, to procure uh, military equipment and military technology. Yeah, they're, they're very good. And also energy. You know, China needs energy to, to develop itself. And um, as for Xi Jinping, in my uh, uh, observation, uh, Putin is a kind of role model uh, for Xi Jinping for many years. Because Putin's image is a strong leadership, very masculine, and uh, leading the country by himself. Uh, when Xi Jinping came into power in 2000, uh, uh, 2000 uh, 12, I think, I think, yeah, 2012, you know, the, the previous uh, leadership in China was a collective leadership under Hu Jintao, uh, very weak. So the, all the, uh, the uh, standing members of the Politburo uh, did their own business and making a lot of money, corrupted, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the serious uh, reform should be done. Uh, but uh, did, uh, was not done uh, at all. That kind of situation existed. So uh, Xi Jinping uh, actually emulated uh, Putin to change the rule and uh, uh, try to extend his uh, term, li uh, term, so lifting the, the term limits and run for the third term. So it is a kind of a, a kind of a uh, kind of emulating Putin, but this time. Uh, Xi, Xi Jinping is uh, kind of disappointed by Putin because uh, Russian military's performance is so bad. Right? So um, uh, Xi Jinping bet on Putin's gamble, uh, but not successful so far. And, and you mentioned uh, uh, Russia's uh, you know, the tech, military, techno, the technological capabilities of Russia's military, which now have to be in question to some degree for the Chinese, having watched uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese are, you know, of course, uh, the famous example for China, the two famous historical examples that the Chinese studied so much. First was the collapse of the Soviet Union to make sure that that mistake did not happen uh, in Beijing. And the second example was the, uh, the uh, 1991 Gulf War, uh, where the information-centric warfare uh, by the United States proved to be such a massive qualitative uh, advantage. Uh, I'm just wondering, if, is your sense, do you think the Chinese strategists will be, they're obviously going to spend their time looking at Rus Russia did right, what Russia did wrong, if Russia did anything right in, in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that's going to change Rus uh, Chinese concepts of warfare at all? I think there is a big impact. You know, uh, China uh, used to have a uh, you know, military cooperation with the United States in the 1980s. You know, there was a, a joint uh, development uh, a program of uh, jet fighters, that's called Black Pearl uh, programs and so on. You know, even the jet fighters uh, uh, jointly developed uh, between you know, the United States and China. But after the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989, uh, China had no way but to seek Russian support. Uh, in the military. So uh, it's already more, more than 30 years. So China cannot simply change, you know, uh, no matter how good or how bad the Russian technologies uh, mm -hmm. are. China has no, no, no uh, choice uh, but to choose it. You know, to some extent it's true for uh, India. That's why India's performance in the United Nations are a bit disappointed. You know, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, where, where uh, do you import uh, your, your weapons? Uh, where uh, your uh, weapons are coming from? That's very important. So no matter how uh, good or how bad Russians, uh, Russian military is, uh, China has no way but to choose it. But 
uh, if you take a look at uh, Russians' weaponry and also U.S. weaponry such as javelins and the stingers, they work very well. And uh, 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 Russian military couldn't uh, see the, their superiority uh, in a very early stage. And uh, also uh, their uh, land uh, power also had to stop uh, before the big city because you know they, they have vulnerabilities in the cities. Uh, tanks and artillery have uh, vulnerabilities in the cities. So they found that Russian uh, land-based technologies and also air-based technologies are not that good, they thought. Now, that's a very good lesson for, for China. And it will change their calculations uh, in their own operation planning uh, toward Taiwan. You know, in, uh, their, in PLA's uh, playbook, playbook on Taiwan, they will, uh, uh, you know, jamming and also uh, uh, doing a cyber warfare and also doing, a, uh, you know, hybrid warfare and launch a lot of ballistic missiles uh, to Taiwan and seize the air superiority and uh, going to bombing uh, Taiwan's military uh, spots and sites. That's why they are trying to, uh, to, to go around the you know, island, island of Taiwan, because there is a military, military necessity to do so. They have to go around and uh, you know, launch uh, missiles from the eastern side of the, the island. That's why they have to go around. Uh, but if the ballistic missiles uh, and cyber warfare cannot uh, completely, you know, uh, diminish the Ta uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, air power and uh, anti-air uh, capability. The calculation will be changed very drastically. So the time frame of war will be very long, and uh, as we we are witnessing in in Ukraine, so the the calculation should be very changed. The risk is heightened. So. I think that uh, the lessons of uh, you, uh, no, war in Ukraine will change PLA's war planners' uh, ideas. And, and arguably will also change the way Taiwan reacts, the way the United States reacts. And, I mean, I, I guess if you're sitting in Beijing and you see that uh, the, the global alliance is not the right word, but the, the global uh, reaction at, at such, a, such a high level to what uh, Russia is doing, you know, including the Swiss joining in and the sanctions yeah. unheard of, uh, you know, the, the German government with the Zeitenwende all of a sudden stepping up, meeting its, cap its commitment to NATO, uh, you know, spending additional sums of money, you know, all of a sudden if you have Germany with its incredible technological capability uh, putting serious amounts of money into defense, mm -hmm. that could be a game changer in terms of U.S. capacity for for, for the Indo-Pacific, there's so much going on. You know, obviously, we have to uh, uh, put a lot of money into shoring up uh, the NATO periphery and the Black Sea periphery, depending on where things go. But if, if you're China, you're looking at this, and you've, you've got to, you've, you, you sort of have to wonder, the, you know, there have already been some relatively tough, st tough statements out of the ASEAN countries uh, about Russia and and even some implicitly about Taiwan now, uh, where a lot of the countries that normally hedge between us and China all of a sudden are, are sort of uh, saying things about uh, territorial integrity and the like that the Chinese have to be, this has to be deeply worrying. They, they can't feel that anything but let down by what uh, Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. has done. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, Taiwan's uh, strategic value uh, is re- uh, re uh, uh, discovered recently, you know, especially the, uh, the during the COVID pandemic, um, and uh, you know the the most uh, the best the best uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer is in Taiwan, right? Mm. So um, you know a lot of uh, strategic strategic thinkers and even ordinary citizens are rediscovering Taiwan's importance, and. Um, you know, the Taiwanese people also uh, found their own importance, and they, they, they're witnessing what's happening in, you know, in Ukraine. And uh, there used to be, you know, uh, kind of scenarios of 
you know, China attacks Taiwan, then what would, should we do and what would uh, U.S. do and what would Japan do? But it is a real, you know, a war that is occurring. And there are, there are maps and uh, the capital city is now being attacked and so on. So I think that this is going to have a very big impact on Taiwanese people themselves. And uh, in my understanding, you know, Taiwanese people, majority of the Taiwanese people were uh, really moved by the Ukraine, you know, citizens, you know, resistance, strong resistance against, uh, you know, the Putin's invasion. You know. So um, I think that uh, although uh, opinion polls are not come out yet, uh, majority of the Taiwanese people uh, basically support Ukraine and uh, blame uh, Russia, so that uh, you know the Taiwanese government has decided to uh, do sanctions against Russia, and most most of the you know, people support it. And uh, I think that uh, this kind of quick adjustment of uh, Taiwanese people and also the rest of the world are really, really amazing, amazing change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's it's unbelievably striking, and particularly Taiwan, which. Ukraine is actually a Chinese ally. I mean, they, yes. China and, and Ukraine have this nuclear agreement whereby <laughs> China is supposed to defend uh, uh, Ukraine and if Ukraine is attacked by nuclear weapons. So that's obviously not going to be the case if, God forbid, Vladimir Putin should uh, you know, drop a tactical nuclear weapon, which remains within the realm of capabilities. But it's, it's fascinating because the Taiwanese have not been able to get any traction at all in Ukraine. And, there have been some arguments that uh, both, you know, that the Biden administration policy on Ukraine drove the, uh, particularly after the decision to uh, remove the sanctions on Nord Stream 2, drove uh, the Ukrainians further into the hands of the Chinese. Um, it's fast. That's a big irony. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting because, and, 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 and let me ask you one question about your assessment. Because in, in Washington, we think, uh, you, you know, you mentioned that Putin's focus, you, you think, was on the fact that uh, we were sh moving to the Indo-Pacific. But in Washington, a lot of us feel that it was uh, the weakness the administration showed in the withdrawal from Afghanistan that, uh, that was, was a key factor in, in Putin's decision. Do you think that was a factor? Might be. Might be. But um, um, it's really difficult to say, you know, that... Uh, again, Afghanistan is not uh, traditionally not a part of U.S. sphere of influence. 9/11 sure. uh, changed U.S. Sure. behavior, and uh, it was uh, a kind of a, a quite a, um, um, how, how should I say? It's anyway, it's not a part of U.S. influence. No. So the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan is a matter of time. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe the timing and the approach was uh, were not uh, ideal, idealistic. But basically, and also the, most of the American people, uh, at that time they cared a lot, but not that, you know, uh, cared okay, much. Sure, sure. That's uh, the, that, uh, the dark side of the reality, uh, you know. Uh, it also helped. Uh, you know, Putin's calculation. Mm -hmm. But Putin has made a lot of calculations. Right? Sure. Uh, U.S. is now focusing more on China, uh, more on Indo-Pacific, sure. and with, with withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan actually contribute to, sure. to the refocusing uh, to the Indo-Pacific. And also, um, you know, oil price is now very high, and the winter time is good for uh, Russians' military, and uh, yeah, there, there, he, he made a lot of calculations, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's not only uh, a single uh, sure. issue. It's a kind of a accumulation of many, many factors. Yeah, you, you've referred to uh, the invasion of Ukraine by, the, by Russia as a 9-11 type yeah. event. You know, in 9-11, we saw all sorts of uh, new alliances, partnerships uh, sprout up. What do you think the impact's going to be? Are Russia and China bound together, or is, is, is it possible that we could see this uh, partnership without limits as they, Putin and Xi described it uh, when they met before the uh, Beijing Olympics? Can we see if, are we going to start seeing fractures there? Well, you know, the impact of uh, this war here uh, can be discussed in many ways. First, uh, the you know, nuclear weapon uh, state invades the neighbors. That's such a huge neighbor. 
uh, independent state and uh, the major war uh, actually occur. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's the first one. And the second one is that, you know, uh, the domestic political system is deeply connected with uh, uh, the external behavior of that country. So, uh, you know, non-democracy in you know, a very strong, uh, you know, authoritarian state uh, may launch a really uh, uh, serious war. You know, the, I, I think that Russian soldiers are also suffering. Why should we kill them in that brutal way? So this is, a, I think, that uh, political systems matter, right? Uh, so, and uh, Putin's uh, psychology is also a very uh, important factor because uh, what Putin wants is victory. He never accepts loss. So if he loses uh, in Ukraine, what would he do next? Or uh, even if he wins Ukraine, but is in a very miserable way, if the victory is a miserable victory, uh, he may uh, seek a much bigger victory in somewhere else, or using some more some more extreme, you know, measures. And in Japan, there are huge concern about possible use of nuclear weapon. Uh, I personally do not uh, uh, think that way, but uh, it is still a possibility, still a possibility. So um, if uh, this war extends to that kind of, you know, another uh, triggering, another uh, crisis or chain reactions uh, to other places, I think that uh, this is going to be a very big impact. Well, changing relations of uh, uh, Russia and China. I think that, uh, you know, no matter what happens uh, in Russia, uh, I think that China uh, needs uh, Russia and Russia needs China. I think that this situation would not change for uh, a long, long time in the future uh, because uh, their strategic interest uh, is uh, so important uh, in order to resist the U.S. pressure. So... Um, the, the possible scenario is, for example, Putin is removed by someone else in the Russian government or uh, uh, somewhere, uh, someone else in, in Russia. Uh, the, I think that the following new government should become much uh, more uh, pro-US or pro-Western world. Mm -hmm. And that's very bad for China. Mm -hmm. China will lose Russia, right? So um, I think that China, uh, no matter how bad uh, 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 Putin react, uh, behaves, uh, China has to support Putin and China has to support Russia. W only, when, only when Putin and Russia divide and the new leader uh, is in power, it, only in that case China will exclude Putin and uh, try to support the new leader mm -hmm. and try uh, to uh, uh, let that new leader uh, and uh, Russia stay in China's side, sure. not go to, uh, to the United States. So, it, it, a number of Japanese strategists uh, uh, would come to Washington in the days, and we're delighted you're back after COVID for the first time, and it's a real honor to have you here. There was a sense among Japanese strategists that at the end of the day, China and Russia, before COVID, had very divergent uh, national interests over the long term. In a sense, Russia was, uh, was viewed by, by some as a force for stability in Asia, even if it's a force for instability in Europe. And, and uh, that uh, you know, China, by contrast, was a force for instability in Asia, and that eventually... Uh, and the strategists of the United States have talked about uh, as Russia depopulates, as Siberia becomes depopulated, as China becomes more populous, that uh, China might have its eye on some Russian territories. Do you buy into any of these discussions over the long term? I don't think that way. You know, that actually, there is a big myth that uh, Chinese population is moving from Chinese territory to the uh, Siberian and doing a lot of, you know, activities. But there are some, but there are seasonal workers, basically. Mm -hmm. And they go back uh, when winter comes. Then, 
and in China, uh, there is there is a huge uh, decrease of in population in northeast part of China, and uh, rich rich people go go to south. Mm -hmm. right? You know, they don't go to north, yeah. you know. So basically, uh, they use uh, uh, Siberia or the Far East and Russia as a business field, not a uh, uh, target of immigration. Mm -hmm. You know. So I think that that's a kind of a, a myth. I have uh, visited Vladivostok and did uh, research about that. Mm -hmm. The local people uh, reject that kind of stories. Uh, those stories are coming from Moscow. That's the, what I sure. uh, uh, learned there. Um, there are a lot of, you know, uh, contradictions or uh, 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 hot points between, uh, you know, Russia and China. But still, I think that uh, strategic importance uh, of each other uh, decides the relations. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they don't like each other. They don't trust each other. But they have to, uh, you know, work together. Yeah. Let me let me let me turn the, to a little bit to the question of China's nuclear program, which, you know, in in the midst of uh, all the focus on uh, Russia and all the lead up to uh, uh, to the Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the Biden administration made a number of uh, informal offers to Russia, including uh, on. Uh, 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 return to uh, some of the arms control treaties. I'm wondering what your sense is of China's nuclear program and its, it, its ambitions against both Russia's nuclear program and our own, and how much of a factor is it that we in the United States need to stay focused on it? Well, uh, the firstly, China is not legally uh, binded uh, uh, in, on, on its you know, nuclear development uh, programs. Uh, it is a kind of a historical opportunity for China to develop, develop for example, uh, ICBMs. And uh, China has already decided to increase the number of nuclear arsenals. And East, uh, China's uh, nuclear uh, uh, strategy used to be a quite limited uh, retaliatory uh, policy. But uh, now it is quite different. We have already found more than 250 uh, ICBM silos in Inner Mongolia, uh, Gansu, and uh, Xinjiang. And uh, if they equip all the, the best and uh, uh, developed uh, ICBMs, they will, China will be able to overwhelm uh, US current nuclear uh, capability. And China is very ambitious. And we can see the footprints that um, uh, China has uh, developed its short-term ballistic missiles in the 2000, uh, the, uh, 2000s and the mid-range mid, mid uh, uh, ballistic missiles uh, following that. Now it, it turns to uh, the long-range ICBMs. So um, China is, uh, what China is trying to do is to utilize this historical uh, uh, opportunity to develop its own nuclear capab capability and within maybe 10 years or so, you know, we became, uh, uh, you know, we uh, find that uh, China is much more superior to the United States. In that situation, China can, may, may think that China can deter U.S. Inter intervention to the Taiwan Strait, then ask Taiwan to surrender. So it's not a, you know, I, as I said before, you know, this is necessary for China's, uh, you know, national unification, and which is related to the great rejuvenation of the Chinese uh, civilization. So um, uh, I think that uh, China's uh, nuclear development is on the due course. So I think that the rest of the world should be aware of this reality and uh, has to, has to uh, deal with it. Let me ask you about two other players uh, uh, before we wrap up. Uh, the first is India, mm -hmm. which is uh, we in Washington have been very frustrated with India's uh, unwillingness to uh, uh, condemn uh, the Russian invasion. India obviously is a key part of the Quad. Mm -hmm. You know, is is obviously a partner of uh, the important strategic partner of the United States. You know, a defense partner of Japan. Uh, 
is you know, the you know economic ties between India and Japan are deepening. Defense security ties are deepening. Uh, what's your will? will uh, you know, will India's actions have an impact at all upon the Quad and upon the view of India's reliability as a uh, as a partner? I think that to some extent, yes. I think that uh, India's uh, recent behavior on Russian issue is very, uh, you know, disappointed. But um, I think that uh, it's a human psychology. You know, the India will, will, will try to. Uh, to compensate on uh, the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a kind of mistake. Uh, so in the Quad, that's Indo-Pacific, right? Indo-Pacific, not in Europe. Probably. So I think that India will make more efforts and the rest of the members can ask more efforts Probably. in the Indo-Pacific. I think that that's the natural course to deal with India and India itself, uh, you know, uh, approach to the Indo-Pacific. Okay, and let me ask you uh, finally about North Korea, which gets very little attention in Washington, obviously still commands a lot of attention in uh, Tokyo for all the obvious reasons. Uh, you're Kim Jong-un, and uh, you know, what do you think he makes? What, situ what, is, what does he make of the situation in Russia? The, the you could, Korean, uh, North Korean Russian relations have, you know, have warmed up a little bit in, you know, in recent years uh, with illicit trade, other things going on, uh, ferries between of Vladivostok and uh, Pyongyang. What's your sense of, 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 of what this does to, uh, to uh, Kim Jong-un and, the, the, and the, the danger of his uh, program? I mean, is he, uh, he's, he would seem to be much more of a gambler the way that Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. is and less cautious than Xi Jinping, who himself has taken huge, huge, huge risks that no one would have expected of a Chinese leader. Yeah, it's a kind of a... Reminding us uh, kind of a comparison with the Cold War era, you know, the, the, those three countries are, you know, very uh, uh, big players. And um, I think North Korea, Kim Jong-un is uh, a little bit happy about seeing, uh, uh, you know, Russia's invasion to Ukraine. Uh, it supported it, right? right? And they voted for uh, none, right? Um, because uh, Russia would support North Korea uh, in full-fledged way after uh, uh, this war, you know, the, the three countries are, are isolated from the Western world, so they have to uh, unite again, right? And uh, China is not that happy because the world has been changing very quickly, and China has a very good economic engagement with the, uh, the rest of the world, North Korea is not. So as for North Korea, uh, it can gain more support from Russia, uh, more trade with Russia, more uh, trade with China. Not bad at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, U.S. and the rest of the world uh, are more focusing on Europe now. So although it, it, it is, you know, launching a lot of missiles this year already, uh, nobody actually cares. Uh, they need to do, uh, you know, uh, launching tests, missile tests, because if you don't do, do, do testing, uh, your technologies will get rust. So they, 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 they have to uh, mm -hmm. do testing. And after the uh, deal with uh, President Trump in nine, uh, 2018, they stopped testing uh, for, for a couple of years. And the military has a very big voice that to, to, to resume the test. So they're resuming the test. But the next step is how to attract the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, uh, focus, uh, maybe doing an ICBM test and nuclear testing. But in, uh, they have to do that in a right, right timing for, for themselves. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not the North Korean expert. I don't know when is the right timing now or after the Ukraine crisis, I'm not sure. But I, I think that they will uh, do the test, uh, missile, both missile and nuclear. Uh, wow. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, let me wrap up with a question. Yeah. This is a big year in Japan on the national security front because of the new strategy and various uh, defense guide documents that are going to be coming out. Would you care to speculate of the impact of the Ukraine crisis uh, on these documents and what we're going to, what we're likely to see? 
I think that um, Japanese uh, self-defense force, self forces are very good at uh, training, and their operations in the peacetime is very superbly good and reliable. But uh, for example, their uh, base resiliency is not that good. You know, the air bases don't have bankers. Uh, so in the time of uh, actual uh, war fighting among uh, major nations, I think that this is a very big impact of the uh, 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 Russians' invasion to Ukraine. Actually, you know, war might happen. So uh, in that situation, Japan, Japanese self-defense forces will have to strengthen its uh, uh, base resiliency survivability of the, uh, the power, uh, military power. And also, uh, Japan will have to uh, strengthen its offensive capability. Japan has some limited numbers of uh, uh, cruise missiles, uh, but Japan will have to increase the number and also uh, uh, try, to, try to obtain longer range uh, you know, uh, cruise missiles. Uh, there are there are some discussions about uh, having, uh, you know, uh, ballistic missiles, but it's uh, I think it's a little bit too far, uh, based on the current Japanese political situation, and some other political figures uh, even uh, discuss about the nuclear sharing. As I think it's very far, uh, too far uh, to actually uh, you know take take into account. So um, I think that uh, this war. Uh, uh, enables uh, Japan to obtain more, you know, uh, base resiliency and also offensive capability. Offensive capability is a politically very sensitive issue in Japan, especially the ruling coalition, Kometo, has a very negative view about this. But, you know, every day the Japanese citizens are watching what's happening in Ukraine. I think that this uh, is going to be a very big impact. And uh, after, I think uh, it, it may have a very big impact on the uh, coming uh, upper house election in July. I don't think that the doves would win. I think that it, 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 uh, all the parties, political parties, should become much tougher. Otherwise, they cannot survive. I think that this similar things will occur all over the world. So this is um, the uh, possible outcome of the uh, war on Ukraine. Well, thank you. It's really been an extraordinary uh, and very wide-ranging conversation. I've learned an awful lot. I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Yasuhiro Matsuda of uh, Tokyo University for joining us at Hudson Institute and look forward to welcoming you back on your next post-COVID trip to Washington. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>